serious. I'm bang him a period. My regular chick, y'all, they scratched off a cereal. Cash can, stash, roof for tucking in my sock. In the street, you choose to be a robber or a cop. In the hood, I'm good in the hood. I'm excellent in the hood. Yeah. No pistol, no firearm. Because me and 50, that was my right hand man at one point. We all from this community, all from the same hood. He did his dirt on this block, I did my dirt on this block. Nigga pulling out guns and shits and ratchet, dog. I started that. That nigga's a big ass motherfucker. I'm not gonna let him slap me. Uh, <laughs> Might have to piss it on me anyway, so you know he ain't just gonna slap me. <laughs> Yo! G Unit might go down in history as one of the greatest hip hop groups ever. Even if the original lineup isn't what it used to be, they made their mark and dominated the scene for a good stretch. But here's the thing that a lot of people don't know before G Unit became a rap group, they were actually a gang crew, an OG crew of sorts. G Unit started off as a, a, a real street gang. Nigga think the G Unit shit started off on some rap shit. But we ain't start off on no rap shit, we start off on the streets, my nigga on some gang shit. And when 50 Cent decided to revamp the group and transition into the music industry, one person didn't make the cut into the G unit we all know and love today, Bangum Smurf. Well, you know me, man, I'm Bangum Smurf, man. Former G unit co-founder, you know. Southside Jamaica, Queens, you know, that's where we from. Bangum Smurf and 50 Cent go way back. They grew up together and were thick as thieves, running around the streets, stealing drugs, and doing what they needed to do to survive. It's like, okay, so I 50 don't even, had the block on yeah, lock for a minute? Yeah, yeah, that shit on the man. The whole hood was pumping for 50. Oh, for the real? The whole motherfucking hood. I don't go fucking sun cracking 9495, he was pumping for 50. Wow. He did what he did. Like, 50 ain't back down. 50 was banging out in the shit. I know 50 was whooping them niggas' ass, because 50's a big boxing ass motherfucker. <laughs> but then something happened that completely changed 50's outlook on life. The infamous shooting where he got hit nine times. Because, you know, at the time, 50 had just got shot up and shit. He was beefing with a lot of um, old-timers from Queens, some heavyweight things. That incident was a huge turning point for 50 Cent. He cleaned up his act and decided it was time to move into legit business ventures. But Bang M Smurf couldn't seem to let go of that street life, which some say didn't sit right with 50. Bang M had potential, but he made the mistake of thinking just being on the road meant he already made it. He started drinking his own juice before he proved anything. See, 50 Cent has always been vocal about steering clear of gang-related activities. He's made it clear in interviews that he wants no part of things like RICO charges and conspiracy. He even said he'd rather catch a body than get slapped with a RICO charge. That's how serious he is about avoiding any gang ties. Culturally, they're going, gang, gang, gang. When I get on the record with them, I'll go, I am not gang gang. <laughs> I do not gang bang. I don't like Rico. I don't like conspiracy. <laughs> right. You know, give me a hummus right now. I'll take a hummus right now before you give me that. So when Bang M Smurf didn't want to leave that life behind, 50 Cent had to make a tough call and drop him from the crew. And I looked at Marcus and said, point to Bang M, get this punk a bus ticket. He's going home. It wasn't until that moment that Bang M realized I wasn't playing. When I said zero tolerance, I met zero. Things got even worse for Bangham Smurf when he ended up getting locked up. While he was behind bars, he reached out to 50 multiple times, hoping for some support or maybe even bail money. But 50 Cent didn't visit him or try to bail him out, which obviously didn't sit well with Smurf. When Smurf finally got out of jail, the beef between him and 50 Cent was on. Diss tracks were flying back and forth, and things even got physical between the two. It was clear there was no love lost. Like 20 minutes into the show, 50 decided to come throw water. Want to be a tough guy. Throw water on y'all. Yeah, this is the first time yeah. he came to the right side of the stage. But Smurf didn't let the drama with 50 get him down. He linked up with another former G Unit artist, Domination, and the two of them started their own record label. They were on the rise and seemed poised to make it big. People were even comparing them to Suge Knight, but without all the unnecessary drama. Unfortunately, things didn't pan out the way Smurf had hoped. His career kind of fizzled out, and these days, the only time you really hear his name is when he's talking about 50 Cent. So what really went down with Bangum Smurf? How did he go from being a key part of 50 Cent's crew to being on the outside looking in? 
Bingham Smurf's real name is Daniel, and he was born around 1981 in Trinidad and Tobago. But before the 90s rolled around, he made his way over to Southside Jamaica, Queens. That's where things start to get really interesting. See, Bingham Smurf grew up in the same neighborhood as 50 Cent, and the two of them became incredibly tight. They were more than just friends. They were practically brothers. They did business together and even formed a street gang called G-Unit, which would eventually become the iconic rap group we know today. While 50 Cent was out there chasing his dreams of becoming a rap star, Bangham Smurf was perfectly fine with keeping his nose to the grindstone, dealing drugs like crack and heroin. He earned himself a solid reputation as a real gangster in the streets. Now, here's where it gets juicy. Despite the falling out, Bangham Smurf still looks back on his days with 50 Cent with a lot of fondness, most of the time anyway. Other times, he's been known to diss the man. That's just the kind of complex relationship they had. Their bond was so strong that their kids even became friends. Bangham Smurf once said about 50, I grew up with 50. That's my son's godfather. That dude is a good dude, man. He used to hold my son. Everybody has a sensitive side. I don't care who you are. 50 was a good dude. I used to sleep on that man's couch. He used to cook for me. I was his homie. That's when we had nothing. But when that money came in, he don't got no pride no more. That's a pretty revealing statement right there, showing just how close they were before things went south. So let's roll back the clock a bit. Smurf was 50's right-hand man, and the two were incredibly close. After 50 Cent founded Hollow Point Entertainment around 1999, he even gave Bangham Smurf a 17% stake in the company. Keep that little detail in mind, because it's gonna come up later. Around the year 2000, 50 Cent was hard at work on his debut album with Columbia Records. And back then, G-Unit was still just a street gang. But then, things took a really dark turn. That's the year 50 Cent was shot. The shooter, who was a close friend and bodyguard of Mike Tyson, ended up dead three weeks later. And there were no clear suspects. That's when the rumors started swirling. Some folks said it was a rival gang, while others claimed it was Bangham Smurf himself who was allegedly out cruising around looking for the shooter after 50 Cent was hospitalized. But here's the thing. 50 wasn't about to let that incident bring him down. After spending about two weeks in the hospital, he took some time to retreat and regroup in the Poconos. While he was there, he called a meeting with all the important members of G-Unit. 50 had been dropped from Columbia Records after the shooting, but he had big plans for a comeback. He wanted to turn G-Unit into a rap group and build Hollow Point Entertainment into a label to be reckoned with. And guess who was down for the ride? Bangham Smurf. 50 came down, we had a little meeting this shit, so he was letting me know like, yo, bang him, man, I need you on my team and shit. I'm about to start a new, a new crew, I'm about to come back heavy, man. It's the honor, man, whatever you need done, I'm gonna get it done, because at the end of the day, I'm in the street singing crack, busting my gun anyway. So if there's money involved and we can get rich, whatever you need me to do. For the next couple of years, these two hustled hard to make that dream a reality. By 2002, they dropped the Guess Who's Back mixtape by 50 Cent, and it was a game changer. The mixtape caught the attention of none other than Eminem, and from there, it seemed like they were off to the races. Everything was lining up for 50 Cent and Bangham Smurf to take the music world by storm. 50 Cent used to mention Bangham Smurf in several tracks during the early days of his career, with the most famous one being his feature verse on Mob Deep's Bump That. The ride was wild, and it seemed like these two were tight as ever at least until things started to fall apart. Smurf was pretty much the poster child for what it meant to be a G-Unit soldier. He was always at 50's side, so much so that wherever 50 went, Smurf followed, like his own personal shadow. He was the self-proclaimed head of security and had a knack for hyping things up. People started noticing him for his crazy ad-libs and his tendency to go on rants at the end of songs. Because of this, most folks thought he was a rapper himself. Smurf even made a cameo in the iconic Indie Club video, but unfortunately that's around the time when things started to sour between the two. According to Smurf, he and 50 had this company called Hollow Point Entertainment. They had a solid business arrangement with Smurf owning a solid 17% of the company. Smurf recalled, We dropped the Guess Who's Back CD when 50 was still climbing his way back from nothing. Back then, he wasn't signed to Eminem or anything. He was just hustling to recover. And I was right there with him through it all. He must have trusted me enough to hand me 17% of the company. Then all of a sudden, 50 took off like a rocket. 
Eminem and Dr. Dre stepped in and everything just went insane. I don't blame 50 for all of it. Money has a way of changing things fast. It all started to unravel after an incident with 50's road manager. 50 decided to send everyone back to the hood for four months. Smurf tried to get in touch with 50 during this time, leaving messages and hoping for a response, but no one ever got back to him. He sent me on fucked up. I was in the hood four months. Yeah. When he sent me on four months on top of that, four months. No phone call from the nigga, no words, no how this nigga doing, is he okay? No, none of that. It was around then that Smurf started collaborating with Domination. Unfortunately, Smurf got caught up in a case involving reckless endangerment and criminal possession of a firearm. With 50 pulling away from his old crew, Domination stepped in to fill the gap. Depending on who you ask, Domination was either a member of G-Unit, an affiliate, or a rapper that G-Unit was developing. Regardless of the details, when G-Unit went through its breakup, Smurf and Domination became really close. Domination had Smurf's back through all the ups and downs. Meanwhile, 50 Cent's career was on a serious roll. He dropped Get Rich or Die Tryin', whoa, well, and it went platinum like it was nothing. So when Smurf got locked up and his bail was set at a hefty $75,000, he thought 50 would help him out. But 50 wasn't having it. Smurf's friends from the hood were really put off by this because Smurf had done a lot for 50 when he was coming up. In the end, domination came through for Smurf. They got a bail bondsman, and Smurf's mom put up her house for the bail bond, along with an additional 7,500. How you not gonna send money to somebody that did, you know what I'm saying, took care of your business? That's your business. You got shot twice. Smurf didn't get shot. We get a bail bonds person that says they'll take the house. Smurf's mother's house had to be put up in order to get him out. Just like that, Smurf was back on the streets, but he wasn't about to let 50 off the hook. He called 50 to find out why he didn't help him out. 50's response was that he sent Smurf and the others back to the hood to get their minds right because he was frustrated with Smurf getting into trouble. That explanation didn't sit well with Bangum Smurf, and you can bet it only fueled the fire between them. Despite the rising tensions between Bangum Smurf and 50 Cent, it wasn't all-out war at first. Instead of retaliating, Smurf kept it cool and focused on making moves in the streets. He went back to his old stomping grounds and teamed up with Domination to start their own record label. With plans to make Domination the label's leading star, the duo even formed a group called the Silverback Gorillas and began releasing mixtapes without a single mention of 50 or G-Unit. They were determined to carve out their own path. Everything seemed to be going smoothly until August 15, 2003, when G-Unit released a mixtape called Unit Radio 3 and unleashed it on the streets. One of the tracks on the mixtape, Sleep by the Lake, Tupac, had 50 taking direct shots at Smurf. Hey, Nick. Hey, Smurf, don't think I'll hear you out there talking about me, you little dirtbag. Brush your teeth before you talk about me. Wash under your arms, baby. You smell like Queensbridge. Smurf wasn't going to let 50's disrespect go unanswered. He immediately hit the studio with Domination and cooked up a remix of What's Beef using the classic Biggie beat. And boy, did they fire shots back at 50. The back and forth between the two sides continued, but things reached a boiling point in 2004 at Summer Jam. 50 was on stage doing his thing when Smurf and Domination, along with a whole crew of homies from the hood, decided to crash the party. They taunted 50 from the audience, trying to get under his skin. At first, 50 tried to brush it off and continue with his performance, but when the crew kept pushing his buttons, he finally snapped. In a moment of pure frustration, 50 grabbed a bottle of water and threw it over the crowd, soaking Smurf and his crew. Smurf was furious and tried to jump the barrier to get at 50, but security was on top of their game and stopped him in his tracks. That's when things really went off the rails. Smurf's crew started throwing chairs at 50 from the audience, turning the whole scene into chaos. 20 minutes into the show, and they decided to come throw water. Want to be a tough guy. Throw water on y'all. Yeah, so this is the first time yeah. he came to the right side of the stage. Tee he diss tracks didn't stop there. 
50 responded with a track called These Nigg Ain't Hood, and the game jumped into the fray with his song Unbelievable. Smurf and Domination weren't about to back down. They hit back with another remix diss track, this time using Tupac's legendary California Love as the backdrop for their response to the game. In the middle of all this drama, 50 pulled a fast one on Smurf by edging him out of his share of their joint company Hollow Point Entertainment. At the time, Smurf didn't have much to say about it, but 50 sure did. According to 50, he took advantage of the fact that Smurf wasn't exactly savvy with paperwork. And that's how he managed to squeeze Smurf out of the company. Now check this out, this is a gift. The portion of the company I was giving him turned out to be worth, what, 1.3 million dollars? He started to act funny and shit, I started seeing him acting crazy and stuff like that. I tell him go to the lawyer's office who sign the papers, he got 10,000 for you. Take the 10,000 dollars, that's that. So he gave back a whole 1.29 in order to take $10,000, and this is because he didn't understand what the fuck was going on. Even though Smurf lost his share of the label, the Silverback Gorillas, the group he formed with Domination, were making a name for themselves on the streets. They were starting to blow up and people were taking notice of their hustle. But you know how 50 operates. He wasn't impressed. And according to rumors, he was blackballing Smurf and Domination, using his clout to block them from future collaborations and shutting down their existing relationships. But the Silverback Gorillas weren't about to let 50's antics hold them back. After dropping their second mixtape, they caught the attention of Fredro Starr, another rising talent who wasn't bothered by 50's power plays. Fredro teamed up with the Silverback Gorillas to form their own label, GF Records, Gangster Flip Records. Smurf was in charge, while Domination and Fredro Starr were the main artists, along with a young, talented rapper named Young Dice, who was just 14 at the time, and Big Swing, a rapper known as the Beast of the Game. These five were grinding hard, working on their official debut, and even signing a distribution deal with Coke Records. But of course, 50 wasn't going to let that slide without a response. Rumor has it that one day around 2004, 50 showed up at a video shoot where Smurf and his crew were working. And he wasn't alone. He rolled up with a police entourage, making a real scene. According to the stories, 50 was running his mouth and even flashed a handgun around. Things were looking tense, and it seemed like violence was about to erupt. Smurf was quick to set the record straight, saying, He didn't have no handgun. His hands were outside his pockets, beside his waist the whole time. He had police with him, two vans full of them. All he did was jump out of the car. I had my dudes over there, and I was in the trailer when he came. Somebody told me, I think 50 rode by, but I wasn't sure because his windows were tinted. I got hyped like, what? Sun is coming through my spot. I thought he was trying to shut my stuff down. So I went outside and me and 50 made eye contact as he was turning the corner. I guess that's what made him jump out. So I started going crazy. I'm like, son, how you gonna come through here with police? When he jumped out, the police jumped out with him. I'm thinking, what does this dude think he is? George Bush or something? I'm like, son, you not the president, why are you coming through here with police? As the beef between 50 Cent and Bangum Smurf cooled down, it seemed like everyone was ready to leave the drama behind and get back to their lives. Sure, a few diss tracks would still pop up here and there, but the intensity had definitely faded. Unfortunately, right before the Silverback Gorillas were about to drop their debut album, life took a rough turn for Smurf. He got hit with a 3.5 year sentence for weapons possession. The charges came from a shootout in the neighborhood after 50 Cent sent all the homies from Queens packing back to the streets. Even behind bars, Smurf tried to keep his head up and focus on self-improvement. He planned to get his GED and make the most of his time in jail. But it seemed like 50 wasn't quite ready to let Smurf move on. He kept up the blackballing, making it tough for Smurf and his crew to catch a break. Things took a really dark turn in 2005 when Smurf was attacked by another inmate. At first he claimed he wasn't hurt, but he ended up in the infirmary with serious injuries. There were whispers that 50 might have been behind the attack, but nothing ever came of the rumors. The incident left a lot of folks wondering what really went down. With Smurf locked up, the Silverback Gorillas had to put their album on hold. 
Domination, though, wasn't about to let GF Records go down without a fight. He kept pushing the label and the artists, dropping their debut album, God Giveth, God Taketh Away, in October 2005. They poured their hearts into that album, thinking it might be their ticket to success. Sadly, the album didn't make the impact they'd hoped for, and the label eventually parted ways with Coke in 2006, later signing a deal with Universal Music Group, UMG. After serving his time, Smurf got out of prison around 2008, but his troubles weren't over yet. He was deported back to Trinidad and Tobago, leaving behind his kids and everything he'd known in Queens. Landing in Trinidad and Tobago was like stepping into a whole new world for Smurf. Even though he could understand the languages and everything, adjusting to the culture and the way of life was a whole different story. Determined to turn things around, Smurf tried to reignite his rap career to give his label, Feed the Wolves Entertainment, a boost. He dropped two mixtapes, Kill on Sight in 2011 and Blacklisted in 2012. Unfortunately, neither mixtape took off and his label struggled to find its footing. Meanwhile, 50 Cent was feeling pretty pleased with how things turned out. When asked about Smurf's situation, he didn't hold back, making it clear he felt like he had the last laugh. You understand what I'm saying? Smurf is my baby boy. He's upset and he get confused. When he get confused, you know what he do? He get angry. Cause he doesn't understand. With Smurf stuck in Trinidad and Tobago and no way to get back to the US, it seemed like the two were destined to keep their distance for the next couple of decades. Though he missed his family and the opportunities he had in America, Smurf found a new purpose back in Trinidad. He's been dedicated to helping the youth, sharing his experiences and lessons from his life. Smurf even wrote an autobiographical book titled Wisdom of a Wolf, the G behind the unit, and is working on a documentary about his journey. On Spotify, he's got around 92 monthly listeners, and while he always said he wasn't really a rapper, he's still out there doing his thing.